Well, I am absolutely overwhelmed at the privilege to come and share with you from God's word. And it, it is, a, I consider it a huge, huge blessing on my, to me and a privilege to be here with you, to be in this church. I adore your pastor's wife. I would love to bring her home with me, steal them. We have a big state, Texas. There's a lot of room. So, well, I was going to say something else, but I won't say it. And we have a good economy. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I just want to represent for Texas, okay? We pray for you Christians in California. We do. I mean, we honestly do. When we think, you know, when you start to think, oh, you know, our life is just, and then at a prayer meetings, we'll, we'll bring up the Christians that are really suffering in California. Because <laughs> not your weather. Of course, today, it's kind of like my weather. I don't know. What, I came in, it was 90. I left Houston, and it was 56 or something. So I brought the heat. I don't know. <laughs> but I, we do. We pray for you. We pray for your state, your state's government. We see the trauma that's coming and, and just the whole atmosphere, spiritual atmosphere that our country is facing. And if ever we needed to walk in love, if ever we needed to stand out and to learn how to love others, it's right now in our country. So would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Lord, I just thank you so much for this incredible time. And Lord, I, I just ask right now that you would take these few minutes and these notes and Lord, you would make them yours. I just confess, just like Isla said, Lord, I, there's nothing I can do without you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take over and that you would use this time, Lord, to filter through our minds, some that are distracted about things going on at home or things left undone. I pray that you would insulate our thinking right now so we could focus on your word so we can give you the place of priority and Lord I again I know there is nothing that I could say and I have nothing to say Lord apart from you so I pray that you would keep me focused help me to speak your words Lord and just use this time father that teach us how to love Lord, we've learned so much about what love is and, and the love of God. Teach us how to implement that to the people around us, especially those close to us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. An elderly widow decided it was too much trouble to get all of her kids and all of her grandkids Christmas presents. So she decided for the very first time this year, she was going to send them a check with a card. After a few days after mailing the cards out, she picked up her checkbook and realized she forgot to insert the checks. She cringed as she thought of all those kids opening a card from grandma with a note that said, buy your own present. You know, it pays to slow down and prepare. And the most important preparation is the preparation of the heart. There, in fact, there is no greater expression of a prepared heart than its love. Even the world, even in the world, with its limited understanding of what Christianity is, they know that Christians are to love. And they tell us that all the time, don't they? That's our distinguishing mark. And that's the focus of this third session, learning to love others. So turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible, you can love the person next to you and get real close. Paul is talking in Ephesians 5 about the worthy walk. He is beginning the practical aspect of Christian living. And just so we have a flow of thoughts, so you know where I'm going and you can realize, oh good, she's almost done. We're going to have three points today. We're going to look at first the plea for love, then the pattern of love, and then finally the practice of love. But first the plea 
Look at verse 1 in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Paul says, Therefore be followers of God as dear children. That phrase, followers of God, is really the crux of this whole passage. It sets the tone. That word follower in the original Greek is the word mimetai. We get our word mimic from it, and we know what that means. A mimic is someone who copies specific characteristics. And what Paul is saying is as a Christian, as a believer, even if this, you just got saved, as a believer, we are to mimic God. Why? Because he says in verse 1, you are his dear children. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, at that very point, you became a child of God. And then as his child, we're to bear his likeness. And you know what? As women, we can all understand this. All children, whether your own or you're watching another family, all children, to some degree, resemble their parents. Right? Have you, have you noticed that? How many times do we look at our own children, sometimes in shock, at how much they are like us? Right? And not just in appearance, more likely in mannerisms and speech. You know? Have you ever walked in on one of your, the siblings, they're arguing, and you hear something, you go, oh, where did you hear that from? You said it to me just an hour ago. You know? You, they mimic. That's what children do. And as believers, as children of God, we are to mimic God. We are to imitate him. Paul says, therefore, be followers of God as dear children and walk in love. That's the plea. The plea is for us to live imitating God, specifically his love. Our lives are to be characterized by love. But what does that mean? Well, just mentioning that word, and even though we've had two sessions to explain that to us, because of its familiarity, we can almost turn a deaf ear. Oh, I know all about love. I know what, I, I know what love is. But beloved, the secret to Bible teaching is to keep reinforcing biblical principles in different ways. So you're hearing the same thing, just in a different way. Principles we know in mind but tend to forget in behavior. In other words, if you've heard this before, and I guarantee you, you have, God is repeating it for a reason. And the reason is he wants us to start living it. So he says, verse 1, therefore walk in love. That word walk in the Greek is peripateo, and it means lifestyle. It's speaking of a lifestyle. In other words, this is not something you do sporadically. It's not something you do weekly. It's daily. In fact, it's moment by moment. And understand, this is not a suggestion. Like Gisela said, this is a command. Love is to be a moment by moment vital part of our Christian life. In fact, the most normal, natural thing excuse me, for a Christian is to live a life of love. And because of that, if you're not experiencing, as a believer, a total life of love, it's not because it isn't there. It's because you're not allowing it to function. But let me try and put this in an illustration just to make it clear. Think of it like this. Which is easier, to breathe or to hold your breath? I mean, most of us, since we've been here, have been breathing, right? Since you got here, I mean, we haven't had an ambulance pull up. No one has an oxygen tank. I don't know. But everyone, ever since you've been here, you haven't had a problem breathing. In fact, you haven't even thought of it until I said it right now. You didn't get up this morning and say to yourself, okay, remember when I'm at that conference. Breathe. Breathe. Keep breathing. Don't forget to breathe. No one sitting next to you is nudging you. Are you breathing? Are you still breathing? more likely during this session. Are you sleeping? <laughs> You're all here right now just breathing. The pressure of the atmosphere around you exerts its pressure on your lungs and it forces you to breathe. It's natural. On the other hand, it's very difficult to hold your breath for a prolonged period of time, right? We all know that. In fact, if you do that for too long, what happens? You die, okay? You die. Why? Because you're fighting against what is natural. 
When you became a Christian, beloved, the most natural thing in the world was that the love of God was shed abroad in your heart, Romans 5, 5, and that love naturally flows out of you. In other words, that love should permeate so much so that it's just a way of life for you to love. That's what Paul is saying. Unfortunately, sometimes we try to hold our spiritual breath, right? For whatever reason, God says, I want you to love that person. That's why they're in your life. It's not a mistake. It was planned before the foundations of the world. Love that person. And you know what we do? <gasps> oh, you know it. I'm not the only one. <laughs> you know? You, and, and you know what we, we, I guess we come to that point where or, or you, you try and lessen it in your own mind. You think, oh, I love her in the Lord. I just don't want a vacation with her, okay? <laughs> I, I love her. And Paul is saying, if you're going to call yourself a child of God, you need to act like it. You need to walk like he walked. You need to stop holding your breath around that person. That's the plea. Now the pattern of love. There are three facets of God's love from this passage that should be seen in our lives. I mean, if we're going to define what it is to love others, these are things that need to be evident. And we're going to spend just a little bit of time developing this. First, God's love is forgiving. Look again at verse 1. He says, therefore, that word, if you, you know, always takes you back to the previous passage. In other words, Paul says, in light of what I just said, and what has he just said? Look at verse 32 of chapter 4. And be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Walk in love. How does, God, how, does, how does God's love display? How is it displayed to us? It's displayed in forgiveness. That's a quality of God's love. His love is literally drenched in forgiveness. In other words, if you want to know if you're a loving Christian, you can say it like this. Just measure your love through your attitude of forgiveness. You see, beloved, when God wanted to reveal the measure of his love towards us, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he took unworthy, wicked sinners and he died on the cross to bear their sins so that he could bring them into an everlasting, eternal relationship with himself. That's the measure of God's love. And that's what we're to imitate. So that our love is best measured in our ability to forgive the people around us and the people in the world. So today, measure your love. Do you walk in love? Paul says we are to forgive, notice, as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. What does that mean? Just this. No matter what anybody does to me, whether it be in my personal family, the family of believers, the church, or in the world, no matter how they hurt me, harm me, slander me, offend me, whatever it is, Christ has already paid the full penalty for that sin. Jesus bore in his body all of our sins. If someone sins against me and my reaction in my humanness is to be angry and bitter and resentful and vengeful, beloved, that's sin. And Jesus Christ already bore that sin in his own body on the tree. That's 1 Peter 2.24. He already spilled his blood for that sin. If the God of the universe could take that sin, put it on a cross on his own son, and forgive that person? Who am I to demand blood from that person? See, the next time you want to lash out at someone, the next time you want to say an unkind word or be bitter or gossip or retaliate or hold a grudge, remember the very thing they did to you, Jesus Christ already paid the price. God, for Christ's sake, forgives you. And beloved, we for Christ's sake, are to forgive the people around us. And again, the depth of our love, the measure of our love is seen in how willing we are to forgive and extend forgiveness. Look at your life. And I know in my own heart, I, believe me, I'm only talking to myself. 
how much do you forgive? You see, if you're here, and in your mind you're holding a grudge against somebody, and you, that doesn't have to be necessarily said. It's just between you and God, which should never last more than a second. But you're mulling it over, and you can't let go of it. Go of it. If someone in your home has offended you, someone in the workplace has slandered you, if you're angry with someone plotting something against them, beloved, that's not their problem. That's your problem. Your inability to forgive reveals the measure of your love. But there's another side to this. It's not just how you forgive. It's how much you know that you have already been forgiven. You see, you can tell a person's love by how they're willing to forgive others, but you can also tell someone's love by how much they know they've been forgiven. Forgiveness is a pledge. It's a statement of undeserved, unearned love that says no matter what you've done to me, there's no anger. There's no desire for vengeance. I feel no self-pity for myself. Instead, I extend my love to you fully. That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness the way God forgives. And listen, we're, every one of us, as a believer, we crave God's forgiveness, especially after a failure. We saw that. Gisela shared that. How much, how hard it is or how difficult when you fail, and yet you come to God and he is quick to forgive. Quick to forgive, quick to release. He never holds a grudge. He's not like us. We long to hear God say, I heard your prayer. Your sins are forgiven. Be comforted. Come back into fellowship. And maybe you're here today and God brought you here just to remind you of that. That forgiveness is extended to you today. He wants you back. But beloved, there may be some here who are hearing this and God is reminding you that there are people in your life who need to sense love from you through forgiveness, that you need to let that go. You see, the natural outcome of being forgiven is to want to forgive. And the people who have the greatest sense of forgiveness in their own lives are those who will grant the greatest forgiveness to the people around them. When you realize the depth of all you've been forgiven, you'll forgive in measure to that. There's a great illustration of this in Luke chapter 7. It's a story of Simon the Pharisee and a woman with Jesus. Simon has invited Jesus to his home for a meal. He's planned this whole evening out. It was going to be great until a woman, I love her description in the Bible, a woman in the city who was a sinner. I just want to, I can embrace that. I think that's me. A woman in the city who was a sinner slipped into the courtyard and spoiled the whole night for Simon. She came over to Jesus. She made a whole scene. She's crying. She's wiping his feet with her hair. She pours out this ointment. And Simon sees this and thinks to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she was. And Jesus gives a little parable about forgiveness to Simon. And this is how it ends. He says, Simon... Her sins, which are many, in other words, God recognizes she was a sinner. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. So she shows much love. But a person who has been forgiven little in their mind shows little love. You see, Simon's problem wasn't that he didn't have sin. It was he didn't recognize it in himself. He was so self-righteous, it blinded him to his own sins and he misunderstood and misrepresented the woman at Jesus' feet. His need for forgiveness was greater than hers. And his need to extend forgiveness was so needful. But beloved, one reason a person struggles with loving others through forgiveness is because when you're not experiencing the cleansing work of the Spirit of God in your own life on a daily basis, when you begin to rationalize your own sin, uh, looking at the speck in your brother's eye, not realizing you have a plank in your own, you begin to develop a coldness, not only towards others, but certainly towards him. And rather than love, you find yourself critical Bitter, suspicious, unkind, proud, self-righteous, and self-justifying. 
See, if you have an issue with someone, ask someone close to you, do I sound critical? Be careful. Have a chair nearby. Because if they're honest, you know, when you have a grudge, it seeps through every part of your life and especially out your mouth. When you're holding back forgiveness, you become this, you, you, stuff comes out that shouldn't be. But when you experience God's love covering a multitude of your own sins, you tend to look at people differently. You serve in the church differently and you love differently. Maybe today you need to spend some time reacquainting yourself with the love of God through his forgiveness, experiencing it in your own life, asking God to search you and know you, and then be willing to extend forgiveness to someone else. Again, the gauge of spiritu your spirituality is not how much charisma you have. It's not how much theology you know. The gauge of true spiritual life is how you love others. It's kind of like a Christmas tree, you know? Can you tell what kind of tree it is by the gifts that are underneath? Oh, look at all those gifts. I think it's a cypress. No, no, you can't do that. The gifts make no difference. You, you can't tell about the tree by the gifts, but by the fruit the tree produces. It's the same with Christians. Some Christians can look so dressed up on the outside. They can have all the gifts activated. They're all lit up. But if they have no spiritual fruit, the tree is withering. So love toward ours, others first, if anything, it's forgiving. Second, it's unconditional, literally. It means without a response. In other words, God loves you if you never respond to him. That's what unconditional means. God loves you if you hate him till you, till you die because it's the nature of God to love. It's unconditional. You're going to love regardless of the response you get from your love. Third, God's love is self-sacrificing. Look at verse 2. He says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. Biblical love at its core is an act of self-sacrificial giving. True biblical love says, I will love you even if I never get anything out of it. It is completely sacrificial. It is the complete opposite of what we see in the world around us. The world says, I'll love you because of what I get back from it. God's love says, I love you if I never get anything out of it. This is the love we're to imitate. Listen, you want to make a difference in your marriage? You want to save your marriage if it's on that last thread? Love like this. Love like this. You want to make a difference in your children? Love like this. You want to make a difference in your friendships? Start loving like this. Commit yourself to love not for anything you get out of it, but simply because you want to be like Christ. Because his love is in you and you want it flowing out of you. Think about it. Jesus Christ didn't love us because of what he could get out of the relationship. Right? He loved us in spite of the pain the relationship would bring. It's what you see in John 13. The very night of the Lord's betrayal, the night before he goes to the cross, the disciples, his closest companions, the ones that were there to the end, are arguing about who's going to have, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. And that was their big concern. He is carrying the weight of what is about to happen. And their biggest concern is who is going to be the top dog, the son of God who is about to bear the sins of the world for every human being that ever lived. And they don't even give it a thought. I mean, it's the epitome of selfishness. And in the midst of all of that, no one would dare stoop to wash someone else's feet. Because listen, you can't stoop when you're fighting and arguing about who's going to be on the top. That, that you're not going to do that. So the meal began, and after the meal, Jesus, rising from supper, it says, laid aside his garments, took a towel, poured water in a basin, and began to wash their feet. This is unconditional, forgiving, sacrificial love in action. And do you notice? He never asked a response from any of them. He doesn't come up to Peter and say, now, look, knock it off. 
start showing love and I'll wash your feet. doesn't say that. He washed their feet regardless of their response because love doesn't depend on a response. John 13, 13, he says, You call me master and Lord, and you say, Well, for I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In other words, you saw how I lived. You saw how I loved. Unconditional, total, total forgiveness, complete self-sacrificing. And I expect you to do the same to one another. Not only do I expect it, I've equipped you to do it because I've poured my love into your heart. That's the pattern of love. Beloved, if we're going to love others, we have to do it with a forgiveness that has no limit, unconditionally, with no dependence upon their response. And we must love sacrificially with the giving of ourselves, not seeking something from them. When Jesus Christ loved us, he did it through total forgiveness. He never asked for a response, and he did it sacrificially. That's the kind of love we experience every day, and that's the kind of love we need to imitate. Look again at Ephesians 5. He goes on, and he says in verse 2, Walk in love as Christ also has loved you and given himself for you, an offering, I'm sorry, that's verse 1, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. The ultimate act of love was at the cross, and it was to God a fragrant aroma. In other words, it was pleasing to him. It was acceptable. Beloved, if you want to live your life pleasing God, if you want your life to rise to him like a sweet-smelling aroma, then let your life be characterized by his love. That's what Paul is saying. I read an account that really illustrates this for us. I think in, in our era that we live, Teddy Stollert, qualified as one of the least in the group, disinterested in, disinterested in school, musty, wrinkled clothes, hair never combed, one of those kids in school with just a faceless, expressionless face, sort of glassy, unfocused stare. When Miss Thompson spoke to Teddy, he always answered with a one-syllable word, unattractive, unmotivated, and distant. He was just plain hard to like. Even though his teacher said she loved all the class the same, deep down inside, Miss Thompson wasn't being completely truthful. Whenever she marked Teddy's paper, she got a certain perverse pleasure out of putting X's by the wrong answers. And when she put the F at the top, she did it with a flare. She should have known better. She knew Teddy's past records. She knew more about him than she wanted to admit. His past records read this. First grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude. He has a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a good boy, but far too serious. He is a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow but well behaved. His father shows no interest in him. Christmas came and the boys and girls in Miss Thompson's class all brought their Christmas presents. They piled them on her desk and crowded around to watch her open them. Among the presents was one from Teddy Stollard. She was surprised that he had even bought her a present, but he had. Teddy's gift was wrapped in a brown paper bag held together with scotch tape, and on the bag was written for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's gift, out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other children began to big, um, giggle and smirk over Teddy's gift, but Miss Thompson had enough sense to silence them by immediately putting on the perfume and the bracelet holding her wrist up for the children to smell. She said, doesn't it smell great? The children took their cues from the teacher and agreed, ooh. At the end of the day, when school was over and the other children had left, Teddy lingered behind. He came slowly over to her desk and he said softly, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. And her bracelet looks really pretty on you too. I'm glad you like my presents. 
When Teddy left, Miss Thompson got on her knees and asked God to forgive her. The next day, when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. Miss Thompson had become a different teacher, a different person. She no longer was just a teacher. She had become an agent of God. She was now a person committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live on after her. She helped all her children, but especially the slow ones, and especially Teddy Stollard. By the end of that year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement. He had caught up with most of the other children in the class and even passed some. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time after that. Then one day, she received a note that read, Dear Ms. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I will be graduating high school second in my class. Love, Teddy Stollard. Four years later, another note came. Dear Ms. Thompson, they just told me I will be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know the university has not been easy, but I like it. Another four years went by and another note came. Dear Ms. Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month on the 27th, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would have sat if she were alive. You are the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stollard. Ms. Thompson went to the wedding, sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. She deserved to sit there. She had done something for him that he could never forget. She loved him. Beloved, that's loving others. Let me ask you, what is the measure of your love? Do you have a Teddy Stollard in your life? Someone God is asking you to love as he loves? Are you willing to look beyond the outward and just love? And maybe that Teddy Stollard is someone in your home. First the plea, then the pattern, finally, is the practice. Because we all know it, it's not enough to just hear. We need to do. How do we do that? Again, like Esau said, the fruit of the Spirit is love. So if you walk, Galatians 5.16, if you're walking in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of your flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. So we need to walk in the Spirit. But along with that, there are some practical things that we can do. First, realize, beloved, to walk in love towards others, you have to recognize that love is a choice. Agape love, God's love, is not built around feelings. It's not a feeling you can't control. It's a choice you can control. In other words, that excuse, I just don't feel love for them, yeah, that's not going to work with God. That's not going to work. Sorry. <laughs> It can be very freeing, though, to know that it is a choice. Because sometimes we hear people say, I don't feel that love. Or I struggle feeling love. It's not about feelings. It's about choosing. I, I love what C.S. Lewis said. Do not waste your time bothering whether you feel love for your neighbor. Act as if you do. And as soon as you act it out, as soon as you start walking in love, you'll find one of the great secrets of the Christian life. When you're behaving as if you love someone, you will find yourself loving them. If you injure someone, you injure someone you dislike, you'll find yourself disliking them more. In other words, your choice makes the difference. Your choice is like the engine of a train. Your feelings are supposed to be the caboose. That's the way God designed it. Feelings follow the engine like a caboose follows, like a caboose follows the engine. If you make your emotions, your feelings the engine, you're going to struggle your whole life until eventually you derail yourself and everyone around you. But if you step out and choose to love, your feelings will follow. And let me say this, it's a choice you have to make over and over again. It's just not a one-time thing. In other words, you don't love someone and say, Phew, glad that's over. Gosh, let's get on to the important things, you know? I don't have to think about that anymore. I've been waiting a long time to love that person, and now it's off the list, just like Gisela said. I finally did it. I can move on. That's not how love works. In fact, it's the complete opposite. The more you love, the more you should love loving. 
The more it's exercised, the less it's satisfied. In other words, you have a reservoir of love that is unlimited and immeasurable, and your responsibility is to distribute that to people your whole life long, everyone you meet. So first, recognize it's a choice. Second, remember it's a command. Ephesians 5.1 is a command. He says it like this in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Verse 38, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's a command. The law and the prophets hang on that. If you want to narrow down every, to those two things, that's what it is. And like Gisela said, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, it's a command. And if you want to show love to God, keep his commandments. I love that word keep. It literally means to watch or to guard as a precious thing. Like a priceless diamond, you treasure it. In other words, it's not the kind of obedience that's forced, you know? A forced, pressured obedience. It's not a crushing legalism. It's not the idea, okay, I heard this, went to this conference, and now I have to do this, you know? God is bringing that person to mind, and you're, oh, no. I have to do this if I don't do this. I'm going to get in trouble with God. He's going to be really mad at me, and I'm in time out for the rest of the week, okay? No. I have to submit to this as painful as it is. That's not what it means. It's not a, a pressure to obey. It's a desire to please God. Can, can I put it in an illustration? My husband, I adore him, among other athletic abilities, was a sprinter. That's what he was. He was a sprinter, and he got all kinds of trophies. We have them all in the garage somewhere. <laughs> but he, he was a good sprinter. I mean, he was like top. Well, I've come to find out after about 30 years that sprinting is really in his blood, okay? Because when he drives, he sprints. Very fast, very short. And he had a little car, fast little car, uh, a few years ago, and he sprinted himself right into a ticket. And, you know, they come home. I was home. Uh, he had left for work, and, and, like, 30 minutes later, he's back. And, you know, they come in with that look on their face. And you're like, what's wrong? What's wrong? Something happened. Something happened. He's like, he goes, well, it's that car. I went, what? And he goes, it's that car. I, I got a ticket. I was like, okay. And he goes, it's that car. It's an evil demon car. I was like, he goes, I'm trading cars with you today. Give me your keys. And I was, I go, oh, leave the demon car with me. Okay. And I wasn't thinking, I, I wasn't going to do anything that day. And he said, I'm taking your car. I mean, I just, this is ridiculous. I can't believe it. I got a ticket. So he goes to work and I was thinking I was not doing anything that day. And I, st you know, about two hours went by and I really, I remembered I got to go to the bank. I have this one thing to do. I'm just going to do it. And I go outside with my keys and there it was, the little demon car. I okay, well, I'm just going to go and come back. It's all I'm doing. So I get in the car, and I'm going out, and, you know, cute little car. was cute. We don't have it anymore, but it was a cute little car, and we have, you don't have this in California, but in Texas, we have stretches of land where there's just land, you know, it, just land and cows, and I was going to take a shortcut to the bank and miss all the traffic lights and go down this one road. I... And I don't know if it was like in cattle, you know, buggy car carriage days when they made the speed limit for that street that don't let the horse go over 30. What? But it, it was 30 miles an hour. Well, I wasn't even thinking. I just wanted to get to the bank and come home and do what I was doing. And I'm in the car and I'm going down. I didn't even look down the speedometer. And all I saw was a flash going by me. And it looked like a police car. And of course it was. And you know what you do? when you know it's a police car? Okay, some of you don't know, but let me explain what you do. You immediately take your foot off the, off the gas, okay? And you resume the position, 10 and two. 10 and two, and you are looking in the rearview mirror. He made a U-turn, he got right on me. And I'm 10 and two, and I'm, my foot is off the gas. I, I don't even think I'm moving. I was going so slow. <laughs> Wildlife is passing me, you know? Was that a raccoon? And I'm, I'm just, I'm sweating. I'm thinking, of, I'm praying, you know, Lord, please, if there's any mercy left in you for me, you know. I'm so, but of course, we know that there is mercy new every day. But it was the afternoon, so maybe I used all mine up. And 
I was just thinking, I, I cannot get a ticket. He just got a ticket a few hours ago. And I, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm just waiting. I'm panicking and waiting. Where's the, reg, you know, where's the registration? I hope it's in his car. Do I have my license? Oh, my goodness. And he never, you know, just, he just kept following me. I couldn't handle it. I just couldn't handle it. I pulled over. And do you know he pulled over with me? There was, and he, he comes up, you know, like they do. I mean, I think they purposely wait. They come up really slow. Just like, let's just get it over with. And we go, I have my thing. I'm ready to give my, here it is. And he goes, he, I roll up my window. He's like, do you know why I pulled you over? I went, no, your lights aren't on. And he looks back and he goes, you're right. He goes, why did you pull over? I said, couldn't handle the pressure. <laughs> it was so much pressure. And then I looked at him, and I, I know because I, I said, can you get a ticket if your lights don't work? He was like, oh, give me your license. <laughs> and he went back, and he came, and he said, slow down, no ticket. I was, because his lights didn't work. But you know what? That is not what Jesus is talking about. <laughs> Sometimes we obey out of pressure. Oh, this is so hard, but I'm going to do it. And God is saying, that's not what I want. It's not some legalistic pressure that you have to do this. When he says, keep my commandments, it's much more than some outward pressure. It's a desire. Not because I'm afraid to mess up, because God's watching me and he's following me. My God heart's greatest desire is to obey him because of what he's done for me because how much I love him it isn't oh I have to do this the idea is I can't wait to do this after all he's done for me I can't wait to do this you see when you love someone anything they desire becomes a longing to fulfill certainly with our precious Lord for a Christian obedience is a sweet encouraging word and obedience to love is an expression of my own love towards him. It's, it's a choice, and it's a command. And finally, you need to challenge yourself every day. Challenge yourself to love the people around you. Challenge yourself to love the people you come across. How? Mend a quarrel that you're in. Take the blame for it. That's loving. Let an old bitterness die. Let it go. No time for that. Forget a wrong that was done to you. Tell someone you love them, someone who would be surprised to hear it from you. Dismiss a suspicion in your mind that you are holding against someone and ask the Spirit of God to give you trust for that person. Encourage someone you know who, who's discouraged. Keep a promise. Keep it. You made the promise. Keep it. That's loving. Train yourself to say thank you, thank you, Lord, for everything in your life, all the time. Pray for an enemy. Send a check to someone you know has a need. Beloved, love as Christ loved us. Forgiving, self-sacrificing, unconditional love. It's a choice, it's a command, and it's a challenge. That's the plea, the pattern, and the practice. Would you, would you pray with me? Lord, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, for just these precious women who have been so patient. And Father, I pray that you would even now, even right now, Lord, put that person in our mind. Make it clear to us right now what we need to do to show love. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's sacrificing for them. Give us the ability to choose and to love to choose because it's what pleases you. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.